Thank you for attending tonight's program in her footsteps, Ida B. Wells. My name is Sarah Davis, and I'm the public programs educator with the Illinois State Museum. This program is part of our four-part series taking place the fourth Tuesday of the month through, this is our last one, featuring Illinois women and their contributions to history, culture, and society. Its aim is to encourage Illinoisans to learn more about women's history in their region and perhaps travel virtually or in person to learn more about their stories. The women featured in the program will also be included along with other female historical figures on the museum's new In Her Footsteps Women's History Trail website, and I will post the link in the chat in a few minutes. The website will pinpoint locations across the state connected to women who have contributed to Illinois history. It summarizes each woman's story and provides information on historic sites and markers that you can visit. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jen Edgington, the ISM's Director of Interpretation. One, um, I am so glad to be here. My name is Jen Edgington. I'm the Director of Interpretation at the Illinois State Museum. As I get started, I would like to recognize that I am speaking from Springfield, Illinois, which is on the ancestral land of the Peoria, Kickapoo, and Kaskaskia communities in a location that was part of the Potawatomi Trail of Death. I honor and respect those who were on the land before me and those who share the land with me now. I would also like to acknowledge what an extraordinary week we've had with the passing of a federal and state holiday of Juneteenth. I am humbled to be able to talk about such an amazing woman that I will be able to talk about today. One of my favorite women in Illinois history is Ida B. Wells, and she was an investigative journalist, educator, and activist. And a little bit about me, I actually joined ISM not that long ago from the Kenosha Civil War Museum, so she was one of the stories I was able to tell there. Um, I do want to give you a warning. We are going to be talking about racial injustice and of lynching. I will not go into details, but I wanted to give you a warning that this content might be hard to hear for some. What I wanted to start with was a quote from Ida B. Wells, a famous quote that I thought was um, resonated with today. And that quote is, the way to right wrongs is to shine the, shine the light of truth upon them. So I wanted to just remind us, this is just a snapshot of her life. I'm only gonna be talking for about 20, 25 minutes. I can't cover everything. So I'm gonna focus on those parts that really resonate with myself. And hopefully if you have any questions, we can go with them later. So let's start with the beginning. Um, Ida Bell Wells was born July 16th, 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Ida was born enslaved. She was born to Lizzie, her mother, and James, her father. Lizzie was deeply religious. James, her father, had a free spirit despite being enslaved. She was the oldest of eight children. Just to give us some context, she was born in 1862. The Emancipation Proclamation went into effect in January of 1863, which was supposed to free enslaved people in the states rebelling against the Union during the Civil War. We know with Juneteenth that did not always happen, but she was born enslaved and shortly got her freedom because of the emancipation. Um, as she grew up during Reconstruction, which happened right after the Civil War, her parents became very active in the Republican Party. Her father, James, actually helped with the Freedmen's Aid Society, and he was one of the founding members of Rust College. Ida herself actually attends Rust College for a little bit to, um, until her parents and one sibling die of yellow fever. It was a big epidemic in 1878. So now she's 16. She has six siblings that she needs to care for. So she actually goes out and convinces a local school that she's 18 and needs a job. And she becomes an educator. She becomes a teacher at 16, pretending to be 18. So she's supporting her siblings, but she soon feel, realizes that she needs more help. So she moves to Memphis at age 20 to live with an aunt. And um, she's able to resume her education with the support of her aunt to help with the siblings. So she starts at Fisk University in Nashville. And here's kind of that, that start 
of her activism and her start of her um, trying to make sure or trying to see these racial imbalances and doing something about it. On a train ride from Nashville to Memphis in 1884, she buys a first class ticket to ride on the train. Upon entering the train, she is told that she needs to go to the black only car despite having a first class ticket and she refuses to give up her seat. So similar to what happens with Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks, Ida does it first on the, on the train. She says she's not giving up her seat and she is forcibly removed from the train. As she's forcibly removed, she actually bites one of the train employees who is removing her physically. During this time, she actually sues the railroad. And at first she wins $500, which is a huge settlement. And especially for Ida, a woman of color to win this. However, later that year is actually overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court and she no longer wins the case. But this is the pinnacle moment of her. This is the pivot where she sees her future that's advocating and that's making sure that she is standing up for social justice. And we're gonna talk a little bit about more about it, but I really wanted to point this out. Um, the picture that you see here is her first chapter in her autobiography that's handwritten. So these are her letters, her words, um, and I just, I think that they're very powerful. This is also a young Ida um, here. But I wanna get into her, her journalism. And um, really this, this train incident starts her passion to write about racial issues. And she's kind of afraid at first to go by her real name, Ida. Um, she's still working as an educator, so she decides she's going to adopt a pen name, Iola, and she starts criticizing the racial inequities in the school district, and she actually criticizes the segregated public schools and loses her job in 1891. She soon becomes the editor of Memphis Free Speech and the Headlight, and she actually is a part owner of the Free Speech. In 1892, her attention turns to lynching. And that happens because she actually has a friend and two associates die by lynching. Tom Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Henry, it's sometimes Henry or Will Stewart, owned a grocery store and worked in the grocery store. They were all black and there was a white business owner across the street. The white grocery store was not happy that the black grocery store was getting more business. Tempers escalated. Cops were called out for a mini riot. And the black store owner, owners were detained in prison. Before they had the chance to go to trial, a white mob actually broke into jail, kidnapped them, and killed them. She saw that the increase of lynching was happening in the South and she felt she needed to do something about it. So she wrote about it and it caused a lot of issues for other people. People were real mad at her. People um, actually tried, well, shortly after the release of this, she actually goes up for a conference in New York. Luckily she's away, but her press burns down. She invested all of her money in her press and it no longer stands. The men or the group of men who did it also threatened to kill her at sight. And so she realizes that she can't go back. I will say I found this amazing article, just a little short clip that I'm gonna read that talks about what happened when her press was burnt. So it's called Driven From Home. The fearless spirit of Ida B. Wells, editor of the Memphis Free Speech, um, has been spoken of, the, uh, of in these columns and her bravery commended. Among all civilized people, comrades commend itself to brave people, but among barbarians of the Memphis strife, her courage was a menace. So these 
brave, chivalrous Southern people made up their mind to drive this plucky little woman out of town. They waited for an opportunity and last week it came. So we can see she actually had quite a reputation of her work, her writing and more. So after this press, she's actually forced to move up north. She moves to Chicago where she feels safe, where she can continue her work. Um, she continues to write articles and pamphlets on lynching and what's really happening in the South that people are not willing to talk about. Southern Horror, Lynching Law and All Its Phases was published in 1892. It's a pamphlet and it's a statistical analysis of lyn lynching that is busting the myth that black men were killed for attacking white women. It's actually instead she finds that most victims were of racial, racial prejudice, quarreling with whites and making threats. So it's not this, they attacked white women, they hurt white women, it's actually something else. And she's the first person to point this out. Um, in her pamphlet, the Southern Horror, uh, Frederick Douglass actually writes a letter to her and it's published. And in it, he thanks her. He thanks her, so I'm gonna read a little bit of it too. Um, Dear Ms. Wells, let me give you thanks for your faithful paper, paper on the lynch abomination now generally practiced against colored people in the South. There has been no word equal to it in its convincing power. I have spoken, but my word is feeble in comparison. You give us what you know and testify from actual knowledge. You have dealt with facts with cool, painstakingly fidelity and left those naked and uncontradicted un un facts to speak for themselves. Brave woman, you have done your people and mine a service which can neither be weighed nor measured. If American conscience were only half alive, if the American church and clergy were half Christianized, if American moral sensibility were not hardened by persistent infliction of outrage and crime against color people, a scream of horror, shame and indignation would rise to heaven wherever your pamphlet shall be read. And that's one of the first things in her pamphlet. She continues this work she follows up with it in 1895, again, she's in Chicago, with a red record. This gives statistics, specific details and photos of the lynchings. I think taking a step back and remembering what time this is, this is the 1890s. Women were not doing investigative journalism and women of color were not. Ida was a one of a kind in this. And it's really fascinating because she starts building skills in her journalism that is still used today. So she uses eyewitness testimonies, she does testimonies from families, and she even goes through looking through the records to broaden her stories and make sure they're factually uh, based on evidence. These are now common practice, but back then, this was kind of groundbreaking. And recently the New York Times released a, another obituary on her and they called her, she pioneered reporting techniques that remain central tenets of modern journalism. So it shows how important Ida was to journalism. I could go on and on about her journalism and what she did and especially to turn light on the horrors that were lynching but I wanna continue because I think that there's a lot of things that she did that are really relevant to Illinois. And one of those is the World's Fair of 1893. So in 1893, the World's Fair was held in Jackson Park in Chicago. It's pretty famous, the Columbian exhibition. Um, African-Americans had to put in petitions to present as individuals in groups and they all were denied. So, Ida decided that she wanted to protest the lack of people of color at the fair. The Haitian building, which is down here in this picture, um, stood as the center for Americans of color. Frederick Douglass was, um, represented the Haitian government during the fair. So he was actually kind of working out of this building and she worked with Frederick Douglass. 
Wells described the Haitian Pavilion as one of those gems of the World's Fair, and in it, Mr. Douglas held Hyde Court. So Ida wanted to have this talk or to talk about the seriousness of lynching at the world stage. And she saw the World's Fair as her opportunity to do that. So she worked secretly with Frederick Douglass and her soon-to-be husband, uh, Ferdinand L. Barnett, and I, Garland Penn, to produce an 81-page pamphlet, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exhibition, the African-American Contribution to Columbian Literature, which you can see the cover of right here. So they worked in secret until it was ready, and then they released it. Um, and so it was intended for distribution of the fair in multiple languages, but due to lack of funding, it was only fully in English. Um, you can see some versions that have German and French too. Um, the Haitian government allowed the use of their building to pass this out. And the pamphlet was written to make international visitors aware of both the achievements of African-Americans since emancipation and the difficult and dangerous conditions they faced after slavery. Ida said, the pamphlet was clear, plain statement of facts concerning the oppression put upon the colored people in this land of the free and home of the brain. We circulated 10,000 copies of this little book during the remaining three months of the fair. Every day I was on duty at the Haitian building where Mr. Douglas gave me a desk and spent the days putting this pamphlet into the hands of foreigners. So that's from Ida. Um, I thought I would read a little bit of the intro just because it is pretty like good for her. Um, it talks a little bit about the fair itself. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but it says the exhibit of progress made by a race of in 25 years of freedom against 250 years of slavery would have been the greatest tribute to greatness and progressiveness of American institution, which could have been shown to the world. Then she talks a little bit more about it, but this is the ending of the kind of beginning, which starts with the seekers of truth. Those visitors to the World's Columbian Exhibition who know these facts, especially foreigners, will naturally ask, why are not the colored people who constitute so large an element of the American population and who have contributed so large a share to American greatness more visibly present and better represented in the World Exposition? Why are they not taking part in this glorious celebration of the 400th anniversary of the discovery of their country? Are they so dull and stupid as to feel no interest in this great event? It is to answer these questions and supply as far as possible our lack of representation at the exhibition that the African Americans have published this volume. So she wanted to make it known that it was because the fair did not want them there, not because the people didn't want to be there. And I think that that's really amazing. So I'm gonna touch a little bit about her life in Chicago um, because this is in her footsteps. I don't really focus too much on her husband. He was great in his own right, um, kind of her counterpart. He served a lot with her. They worked on the newspaper together. They worked together as activists. Um, she marries Ferdinand Barnett in 1895, who's an attorney and a journalist. They have four children. Um, again, he worked in the newspaper and she never outwardly takes her husband's name. She actually hyphenates her own. And she's one of the first females to do that. And she kind of blazed a path because I also did not take my husband's name. Um, I would like to save for Ida B. Wells, but you know. Uh, so I think that her relationship with him is is really strong, but also they serve to help each other in advocating in social justice and in reforming. Um, this is her house. It still stands in Chicago. You can see it. There's several monuments to Ida B. Wells throughout Chicago. This is one of them. All right. And then after the World's Fair, which is kind of the first time she's seen at this, a, uh, worldly level, she actually continues to speak out on lynching. So she takes the issue to the White House in 1898, first to McKinley, but she ends up uh, petitioning multiple presidents on anti 
lynching legislation from McKinley to Hoover. I do want to point out this legislation does not pass until 2020. It is not until last year that there is anti-lynching legislation in our United States government. So she continues dedicating her whole life to speaking out against anti-lynching and making sure people know the horrors that are going on in the South, but not just the South, in places like Springfield and in Cairo. They're happening all over. Um, so she ends up going abroad too. She wants to move her message, not only in this smaller scale, but she wants to go to Europe too. And she goes to England twice. And she actually feels constrained in America because there's the anti-lynching message is not moving past um, black audiences and their allies. And she wants to be on a bigger stage. So she actually goes to Europe to do this. And um, she notices that she's she's treated different overseas than she is in America. And she really starts to, to see what life could be like in a more just, more equal society. Um, she comes back after her two trips in Europe and she's actually one of the founding members of the NAACP. She also goes on to, to find or found quite a bunch of different organizations and in particular, um, oh, and this is her and her children in Chicago. But the one I want to talk a little bit about is her connection to suffrage because this story um, I really enjoy. Um, so she's speaks out, big surprise, she's speaking out, she's advocating for um, black women to be included with white women in the discussion for suffrage. So when she's overseas, she starts talking about how we need to integrate, we need to make sure that everyone has the right to vote, not just white women. And Americans are not too happy with that, but she still comes back and she's dedicated to her cause. So in January 1913, she formed the Alpha Suffrage Club, which is the first Black women's suffrage club. And they actually join with a white woman a club called the uh, Bells. And so they had 200 members total by 1915 to fight for women's suffrage. And um, so she continuously has to push to bring in equality when we're talking about women's suffrage, that it should not just be for white women, it needs to be for all women. And um, I think that it's important to remember that Illinois granted women local suffrage in 1914 and she helped push that through. The Republican party saw the importance and actually asked for help from their group with campaigning. And um, they help get elected different officials in Chicago, especially those that are African-American. Um, so then she decides she's going to go march on Washington in 1913 at the National American Women's Suffrage Association Parade in Washington. She gets to the parade and you can see the parade um, right here in the smaller picture, right in front of, um, we have the woman leading it. That is the leaders of this organization. They are all white women. Ida gets there and they tell Ida that she can march but only in the back with the other black suffrage groups. She doesn't want that. She's not gonna stand for that. So she actually works with the other group, the Bells too, <laughs> to kind of do this sneaky uh, maneuver, if you will. But first, her whole group, her whole suffrage organization is fighting for Ida to be there in the front of the Chicago, Illinois delegation. And the organizers are saying no. So Ida actually hides out on this kind of side. And when the Illinois Chicago delegation walks by, she goes right in the front of the line and joins them. So you can see a very proud, very um, um, understandably proud Ida B. Wells 
marching for women's suffrage with the rest of her delegation, not in the back where they told her to go. This is a huge moment and something that I just, when I think of Ida B. Wells, this story just sticks with me. And this picture in particular is something that I see as a symbol of hope. So I, I know we're almost up on time. So I just wanna finish this up. Um, she also started the Ida B. Wells Women Club in Chicago. She also came down state a few times to protest murders of um, black individuals and ended up actually protesting in the Illinois state capitol against the sheriff who got reinstated after one of those murders. She runs for Illinois Senate in 1930 and actually loses. And she passes away from kidney disease in 1931. I wanted to just end with this picture of her family. You can see Ida seated with her children around her and her grandchildren too. There is so many more stories I could tell you of Ida B. Wells, but I wanted to um, be respectful of our time tonight. So I'm happy to answer any questions we might have. Um, I have, how did Ida earn enough money to have um, been part owner of Memphis Free Press? How did she pay for her travels? Did her aunt keep her siblings? Ooh, those are all really good questions. Um, so during that time, Ida was an educator until she got um, fired, but she was writing as a journalist under her pen name and she was also an educator. So I don't know exactly how she or how much money she had, but she did have some resources because she did have that dual income. Um, as for her, her uh, travels, a lot of times they were actually sponsored by um, Quakers over in England. They would pay for her travels to come, but also at this time, she's a very well-known individual and her husband and her are very successful with their newspaper, with all of the clubs. Um, so that's another way that they could travel. As for her siblings, that's a really good question. I actually don't know what happens to her siblings. There's not much that I found on them, um, but that's another topic for another day, hopefully. Let's see, where are her papers collected? That's a really good one. They actually, um, they're in a few places. One is University of Ch or Chicago, and um, you can see them online. So that's where I got the one today. Um, how, how do you think she would think of the world today? That is Madison, that is a very good question. What do I think of the world today? I started with the acknowledgement of the Juneteenth on purpose. I think that Ida, um, she was a, a very strong-minded advocate for racial equality, right? For She wanted to make sure that um, divisions were gone, that violence against African-Americans and Blacks didn't exist and that were called to light. So there's a lot <laughs> of um, what you would think of of the world because we're in a different place than we were a year ago, right? And there's still a lot of healing to do and uh, movement in both directions. Um, that's a really good question because I think that her statement about shining the light on truth is something that could drive a lot, right? And it's in particular, especially her investigation journalism would come in handy now. I don't necessarily think she would be writing pamphlets, but maybe she would be, you know, blogging or recording. Um, absolutely. Uh, are there any, oh, she did have such a strong personality. Yes. Are there any records left by others about her personality? So I kind of cut this because I didn't have time, but I will share this now. Um, so during one of her pregnancies, she actually is unable to attend the 1908 National Afro-American Council meeting. And it's run by um, two men, including Booker T. Washington, who write back and forth about how they're glad she's not there to complicate the situation. So people <laughs> gossiped about her and um, they really wanted to make sure 
she was strong. She was a woman. She sat at the table when women really weren't invited to the table and she had her opinions. And I think that, um, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to stop the share. Um, so when it comes to Ida B. Wells, when we're talking about her, we need to remember that she came at a time where women really weren't necessarily at the table. Um, so those strong opinions were noted. And in particular, like I said, this one was at the 1908 or 1901 National Afro-American Council. Okay, I have a few different questions. Sarah, I, I don't know if I'm missing the ones in the chat. So I'm gonna just keep going on the uh, Q and A's. Tell me if I miss anything. Um, how about the children? Are they carrying on her legacy? Well, we actually know that um, her great, great grandchild, I believe, is still writing. Um, she just released a book called Ida Be the Queen. Um, her name is Michelle Duster. So that's a new book that just came out, I believe. And it talks about Ida and her legacy. Let's see. Are there any writings of her time traveling outside the US? There are some. Um, with her autobiography, she touches on it a little bit. And then also there are some from the host, the Quaker host that actually hosted her in uh, England in particular. Let's see, any other questions? <laughs> I know Ida was not a fan of Booker T. Washington. Could you comment? I think <laughs> I just did a little bit, but um, one of the big issues were they really, he wanted things done a certain way and she wanted it done a certain way and they did not see eye to eye. So they were both hoping for either um, the National Business League and Council um, into a closer, affiliation with the National African American Council, but there was a division. One wanted it and one didn't. And um, so that was one of the reasons. I hope that you walk away um, being inspired by Ida's story as much as I am and really enjoying um, the, the suffrage story is one of my favorites, I think. I have one more question. Okay, I just can't. Well, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back to Sarah. So thank you all again for attending tonight's program. And we hope to continue the In Her Footsteps programming this fall. So check back the museum's website to see all our upcoming events and programming that we'll be offering through the summer and the fall. Um, and we hope you'll consider a gift to help the Illinois State Museum continue to share stories and start conversations, provide opportunities for learning and growth. And I'll post the link for our website and the link to donate to the museum if you'd like in the chat. Um, and tonight's program was recorded and will be posted to the museum's YouTube page. And I'll also post that link in the chat as well. Um, we hope you enjoyed the program and we hope to see you again at uh, future museum programming. So have a great night, everyone.